Hey everybody, this is Thad Forrester, and welcome back to Patriot to the Core podcast. Uh, this is episode number 24, so I really thank you for the support once again. Uh, today we have a legend from the combat control community, uh, Mr. Wayne Norad. Uh, Wayne became a combat controller in 1971, and so since then, I mean, he's participated in the planning and execution of some of our nation's most sensitive operations, uh, including uh, Cambodia, Panama, Kuwait, Iraq. Uh, so this includes like just Operation Just Cause, Desert Shield, Desert Storm. Uh, he was the guy that landed the first fixed-wing aircraft at Kuwait City International Airport. Not physically landed it, but uh, as a air traffic control type guy, uh, landed one. Uh, he also was there for the opening, helped open up King Fod International Airport. He's just been involved in so many things going on around the world. He talks about being in Cambodia um, in the mid-70s. And they didn't have weapons, they didn't have any uniforms, and just you know how vulnerable they felt and how scary that was at times. Uh, the guys in the combat control community refer to him, some as, as grandfather, some as uh, godfather. But you, you'll see why when you talk to him. He's just really contributed so much to the, the, the field. He's also involved in a lot of other things. Um, the Special Operations Warrior Foundation, and he just does a ton and uh, we couldn't get to it all, so we definitely got to have him back. But if you enjoy the show, please just go to iTunes and rate it. Uh, the easiest thing to do is just go all the way to the far right and select that that far right star, and boom, you've got five stars selected. And, of course, a, a review, a written review would be preferred, but if you don't want to take that time, at least um, at least uh, star it, please. Maybe five stars. I would, I would appreciate it. So let's bring on Wayne now. Uh, Wayne Norad, thank you for joining me today. I appreciate you uh, dealing with Skype and figuring out how to make this interview work. And I've just been looking forward to interviewing you and to finding out really about the the combat control field. Well, great. I'm uh, I'm here to help. So uh, let's let's go ahead and talk about it. Let's do it. So yeah. So from what I know about you, you uh, started in 1971, or you became a CCT in '71. Can you just tell me about, I guess, if that's accurate, and then you know why you chose combat control, how you knew about it, and then what what the pipeline was like then? And I'm wondering how much it's changed, you know, today. Right. Well, actually, um, to go back even further than '71, I actually had almost five years in the Air Force. I crossed I mean. So I came in the Air Force in 1966 and uh, got into the uh, weapons mechanic, or I guess in layman's terms, I was a B-52 bomb loader uh, four years, and then I um, I got out. Uh, I did serve uh, during that time a year in Thailand. Dropped so we dropped uh, our bombs uh, in Vietnam from the ones we loaded in Thailand. But anyway, I got out after four years. And uh, did civilian work for about 10 months, and I rejoined the Air Force and uh, got stationed down in uh, southern Florida, just south of Miami at a place called Homestead Air Force Base. And it was funny, while I was waiting to get my clearance back, uh, I couldn't go out on the flight line and load bombs or anything. So uh, I took up uh, playing volleyball with my supervisor, who was a Hawaiian uh, he was a tech, tech sergeant, and uh, anyway, a great volleyball player, so he taught me how to play volleyball pretty well, and then he asked me to go out for the base team. So I went out for the base team, and uh, we had a, a tournament uh, at Herbert Field, up to Herbert Field, Florida. That was the home of the uh, first special operations wing, and uh, we played volleyball up here, and while I was here for uh, the tournament, I was at the club eating uh lunch one day and these guys had these berets on or in their pocket as we were inside as a matter of fact there were blue berets back then a real uh, dark navy blue and they had their uh, parachutist wings on them so i asked them what they did and uh, one guy in particular took a lot of interest in me and uh, sat down and we talked for probably 20 30 minutes his name was roger claire and i uh, went back to uh, homestead air force base and put my retraining paperwork in so i got accepted it was a not a very hard pt test at the time but i wasn't into a lot of pt having been out of the air force for about a year and so on so anyway i did pass that test but uh, my actual first uh 
school in the pipeline was Parachute Jump School. It was at Fort Benning, Georgia, just like they do nowadays. And then from there, I went directly to Air Traffic Control School at Keesler Air Force Base in Mississippi. And that then was all it took to get put on a combat control team. So I'm back to Homestead Air Force Base, and I'm waiting for my assignment because they didn't have a team there. And I waited and waited and waited, and long story short, I had to go to my first sergeant and my commander, and uh, they got involved, and they ended up getting me an assignment to a combat control team, and that was Pope Air Force Base, my first assignment. And I showed up there in uh, January 1972. Um I can explain a little bit later, uh, maybe in the interview, but uh, I went about two weeks later off to combat control school, and uh, I, I finished that and came back to Pope. Um, back then, the career field was actually a, um, if you will, a subdivision of the air traffic control career field for the Air Force. So what they did was you had a specific career field number, and at the end, they added a D, a Delta D uh, letter. And in the beginning, they added a P, which was for parachutist status. So I was a P back then, 272, uh, whatever your skill level was, uh, I'll just say X, is zero, and then D. So uh, anyway, uh, I finished combat control school and uh, started working the drop zones and so on at, at Fort Bragg. And then I um, went off to survival school uh, at Fairchild. And then later I went to a uh, deep sea survival, water survival, back down at Homestead in Florida. And then I did go to uh, Arctic survival up in Alaska at Isleson Air Force Base. I also attended a jungle survival down in the Panama Canal Zone. Uh, but those weren't required to be in the career field and if you noticed i didn't say i went to free fall school or uh, combat dive school because th those were not required to be a combat controller uh, like they are today so i actually uh, five or six years later ended up going through both of those schools uh, about six months apart so so the pipeline i guess total training what was it back then was it less than a year um to get on that team before i even got to combat control school it was only you know four weeks at fort benning and 16 weeks of air traffic control school and that was uh, basically uh all i had to do to get assigned to a combat control team and then you were a three skill level apprentice skill level and then on the team, they would send you to these different schools and other uh, upgrade training to get your what we call five level or operator skill uh, level, so you could <coughs> excuse me, so you could actually go out and uh, and work, you know, without direct supervision and uh, heavy stuff together, so to speak. So uh, that was, I think, about a twelve month process to get upgraded to the five level. Wow, okay. Well, we don't have a lot of time with you today, so I wanted to get to a few things. Um, I, you know, reading about your, I think this was really when you retired, um, it said that you had, um, you had injected special tactics capabilities into the formation of our nation's premier joint special operations team and while developing high-altitude, high-opening parachute tactics. Blah 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 blah. So do you do you mind? Um, can you explain really what that is? What you did to to help um, with tactics? Uh, I, I sure. Uh, actually, I was uh, I was on active duty uh, way before I retired. It was at the uh, the unit that we now call the 24th Special Tactics Squadron. Um, I am considered a what we call plank holder there. I was one of the uh, first. Uh, 16 combat controllers that were assigned to that unit. Wow. And uh, it was basically the, um, uh, I don't think it's classified anymore, but back then it was highly classified. It was uh, it was training for counterterrorism. So as other elite special operations forces were tasked to 
proficient in the tactics for uh, you know counter terrorist activities uh, we had a small unit uh, that went to Pope Air Force Base now prior to that there was a unit and I wasn't part of this but it was uh, it was a unit that ended up at Charleston Air Force Base uh, previous to that um, I guess to give you a, ba a background or history, uh, the um, there was a Lufthansa uh, German airplane that was uh, taken hostage or t took hostages, and their special operations unit rushed the airplane and got the hostages, uh, or yeah, got the hostages out safe and so on, and uh, it was a pretty big deal. So uh, the president asked the Joint Chiefs of Staff of the uh, of the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, basically the top military four-star general, if we had that capability uh, for counterterrorism. And he kind of lied <laughs> and said, uh, oh, yeah, yes, sir, we do. Well, the next day he called up the Army and uh, told the Army Chief of Staff to put a group together to uh, start training for this mission, uh, that that team now is known as Delta Force. Wow! So at the same time, at the same time, combat controllers were asked to go to headquarters. Back then, we were under military airlift command, and it was under the cover of, of uh, coming up for the outstanding airman and NCO or non commissioned officer and senior non commissioned officer and company grade officer of the year. But when they got up there, they, in fact, were read in on the counterterrorist mission, and uh, they had to sign the papers to say they wouldn't divulge anything. And then they went back to their units. And then from that point for about, golly, it must have been a year or two, uh, and then, you know, these guys would be called on and uh, get classified orders to go and meet and go off and support these exercises for the train-up. And it was to go rescue the hostages that were taken in Iran um, back in 1979. So uh, these guys were off the different teams. They would take their team equipment, their radios, and some parachutes on. So a lot of the supervisors and wing commanders were getting kind of PO to the mission. As a matter of fact, I was the superintendent of combat control school at the time, and uh, two of my guys were tasked to go and support the uh, the mission. I only had four instructors, <laughs> so they took half of my cadre. So anyway, they decided to put these guys together, and they put them uh, as kind of a branch off from the combat control team that was at Charleston. And that team, because uh, originally they didn't have any designation because they were from all from all over the place, they call those guys Brand X. <laughs> mm -hmm. So that's. So then later on, after the Iranian rescue mission uh, attempt failed, uh, the Holloway Commission took place, and there was a recommendation to put a joint force together to train for this kind of thing. And that's when uh, Military Lift Command put a detachment at Pope Air Force Base. It was called Detachment 1 Military Airlift Combat Operations Staff, Det 1 Makos. And uh, it was led by uh, then captain or major uh, coach John Carney. And uh, anyway, there was 16 controllers assigned to that unit in the beginning. And I happened to be one of the guys that was assigned and uh, became one of the one of the team leaders there. Yeah, so the, the guys that I know that have been members or are members of the 24th, uh, they – now, obviously, you may not want to talk about some of this. I don't know. You just handle it how you, how you need to, but – I liken the 24th to the same as Dev Guru or Team 6, and the 24th would be the ones that would deploy, that would attach with, like well, like you said, Delta or with Team 6. Is that correct? Uh, that cannot be confirmed or, or denied. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. Um, now, you were asking about the, the hey-ho procedure. So what happened is while I was there, at uh, Jet One Makos, um, I took my, um, well, at first there was two of us. We went to support the Navy SEALs um, out at uh, a place in New Mexico, and they were practicing or starting uh, high-altitude, high-opening parachute tactics. 
And so myself and my assistant team leader, uh, Johnny Pantages, uh, we went out there and we uh, we worked the drop zone. And while one guy would work the D drop zone, the other guy would jump with the seals. And so we jumped every other time, per se, for each of us. So we did that for about a month. And then they were going over to Germany to a course um, that NATO, uh, North Atlantic Treaty Organization, had a course over there that was run in Germany. And um, we decided that we would go with the SEALs and, uh, and go to that course. So we went over to Germany and spent about a month over there. Uh, it was in, I think, 1983 maybe. And uh, we started doing this high-altitude, high-opening tactic. So uh, we started low for free fall uh, or yeah, for halo, uh, high altitude, low opening. We made a couple jumps at 12,500 feet. And uh, then we started going up higher and started opening our parachutes within five seconds after exiting the aircraft. So we uh, would do that and uh, fly the canopy downwind and try to land on the target. And the higher you got and the more increase in altitude winds, uh, you could you could travel you know, further across the country. So uh, to kind of make a long story short, we got all the way up to we were jumping. Uh, we jumped once at 30,000 feet. We opened our canopy about three to five seconds after we exited the aircraft. And we flew over 25 miles and landed on the target. So, <laughs> uh, so that's what we were uh, practicing over there. Uh, at the time, East and West Germany was still at odds, so uh, that's why the Germans were training hard in that tactic, tactic because they could get out of uh, the airplane in uh, their own country and cross the border because the winds were favorable going from uh, West to East Germany. So uh, we we devised things like we had a uh, it was called a KNS-81. It was a King navigational system that they actually had in small aircraft. And we took that system out of uh, an aircraft, and we attached portable batteries to it so we could use it. And we would attach it to the lead jumper, and uh, it would pick up the tactical uh, uh, nav system called a TACAN. So we actually uh, would know uh, where this TACAN was, and we could set in waypoints and the uh, the drop zone uh, point of impact, or the place where we wanted to land. And we could drive our campies, and the lead guy would be uh, looking at the the instrument to keep us on track to go directly to the uh, to the drop zone. So uh, that was one of the tactics that we that we came under. Uh, and there was a, you know a few other uh, minor uh, tactics that we did. Uh, for instance, it was cold up there that your hands uh, was bitten. And a lot of pain when you get to the ground. You put your arm, and all your blood would rush to the end of your fingers and your, you know, your boat. So what we did was we put these extenders on our parachute uh, steering lines. We had loops sewn in the ends. And what we would do is once we get under canopy and everybody was tracking behind each other, we would pull those out of the these little uh, rubber band holders pull our leg up or our foot up and put it over our feet and so we had each steering line on our toes and now we could put our hands up under our armpits which is the warmest part of your body pretty much the <laughs> core of your body and keep from freezing our fingers and we would steer slightly and keep on track by just pointing your toes up or down <laughs> <So>. <laughs> A little redneck engineer, sounds but, like. you know. But you know that was that was kind of you know uh, uh, barbaric, if you will, days. So nowadays, I mean, everybody knows that we have GPS and they have a lot better ways. Uh, but we high up eighties. That's very interesting. Did the JTAC role exist, or I, when you were going through, or was it called something different? Uh, it, it really didn't exist, uh, per se. What we did, the only thing that we did was we had a checklist, and we had what we call, they still call it the same thing today, the nine line, um, which is nine 
uh, lines of information that you would pass to the aircraft in order to drop ordnance or, or you know, shoot bullets. So that's all we had was uh, the nine line information in case we had to call in an emergency, uh, you know, call in for close air support in an emergency situation. We were not qualified and out there calling in uh, airstrikes uh, all the time. That was uh, something that came uh, later on for combat control. Okay. So, so during Desert Storm, Desert Desert Shield, that time period, what what role did the controllers play? Um, the the initial role was for CCT was we went over there and we actually um, we opened. King Fahd International Airport. The uh, the cement had barely been dry uh, when uh, we were sent over there in August of 1990. It was uh, a captain named Tony Tino, myself. I was the chief at the time. Uh, uh, Senior Master Sergeant Bobby Boyle and uh, Master Sergeant J.D. Birch, and the four of us went up to King Fahd International Airport. We actually opened the airport up. With our portable radios, and uh, in fact, I'm writing a story for the Air Commando Journal right now because it's uh, been 25 years since uh, since Desert Storm. So uh, we opened that up, and uh, there were a lot of things that our guys did during Desert Shield to prepare for Desert Storm. You know, one of our officers, our combat control officers, was actually like the uh, the fuels manager for uh, bringing. Uh, fuel into two or three different places so that um, they could forward air refuel on the ground uh, when needed for helicopters and so on uh, when we did start the war. Um, there was um, a mission behind enemy lines that one of our guys went on with a, a Green Beret uh, Special Forces team um, where he or actually, I take that back. It was a British special boat service team, which is the equivalent of Navy SEAL team. So uh, Master Sergeant Steve Jones went on that team because he was one of the first guys that had close air support um, qualification. I'm not sure they called it JTAC then. It was probably just close air support uh, qualification. He uh, was asked to go. Uh, by the British, or he, they asked us if we could send somebody that had that qualification, and we picked Steve Jones, and he went across the border, and uh, they blew up some uh, some cables and kind of spoiled uh, Saddam Hussein's uh, capability to uh, reach out of Baghdad with uh, with his communication lines being all blown up. So he did that, and then we actually was asked for more guys, and we we put four guys with the SBS and they trained for other infiltration missions but um, they they did not take place um, there were some other Americans going across the border and there was a chance of fratricide uh, with two different countries putting teams in and so on so they they never got to go back in but uh, one of the things they did do is when they liberated the British Embassy they asked our four guys if or they asked us if they could take their four guys with them to liberate their embassy in Kuwait, and we let them do that. So we sent four guys um, with the uh, SBS, and they fast-roped into the uh, British embassy. And then we had one combat controller that went into the American embassy. In fact, he was the first guy in the embassy uh, that was a service member uh, since the uh, takeover of the Iraqis. Uh the other thing that we did was we put PJs, pararescue men, on uh, uh, the Pavlo helicopters and the Army's uh, 60s and 47s, and they provided medical support. But one of the things the CCT guys did was we were asked to put beacons along the border of Iraq and Saudi Arabia so that the F-111 uh, aircraft could update their navigational systems going across the border. So we that was a classified mission too, and we sent uh, I think three guys. They put them on uh, CH-47s and flew them, and they dropped these beacons and these radar def deflectors off in eight different locations. Then they'd call back the coordinates of where they left them, and uh, we would call it into the airplaners um, over at the uh, 
they call it the CAOC, which is at the um, Conventional Air Operations Center, or the Coalition uh, Air Operations Center. So uh, that was a help to uh, the fighter aircraft going through the, the gap, if you will, across the border. And uh, then the, uh, the controllers, uh, uh, tech sergeant then named John Thompson was uh, the team leader. They moved the Army uh, into a, uh, I think it was Rafa Airfield, and uh, believe it or not, at the time, it was the biggest airlift mission since Berlin, uh, <laughs> you know, in the World War II era. So uh, they, they handled, between them and the uh, other controllers from the Military Airlift Command, they handled like 800 takeoff and landings of of uh, C-130s to bring that whole army uh, battalion or our battalion plus in there. Also to back up on when we opened King Fod, uh, we ended up landing uh, having uh, a aircraft count of like 3,000 a day, which at one point was as big or larger uh, count than O'Hare International Airport, which wasn't bad for a couple of combat controllers with a radio on their back <laughs> and grease pencils or whatever to uh, to write down the information. Uh, the other thing that we did was uh, we went up into uh, Kuwait City. Uh, we sent a four-man team with the Marines while they clear it up into Kuwait, up across the border. Uh, we flew in a, I don't know, eight or ten-man special uh, tactics uh, team into the Kuwait City International Airport. And uh, we got to control uh, the first fixed-wing aircraft to land there the next morning. And as a matter of fact, I had the uh, had the honor of being on the radio because I was the only guy forward that was a uh, air traffic control tower-rated combat controller at the time. So, uh, so I got to control the first uh, fixed-wing aircraft that landed at Kuwait City International Airport, and uh, then. That day, uh, on the 28th of February, was when uh, the war was declared uh, over, and uh, we deployed back out of there in the afternoon. The military of command controllers came in and replaced us. Excuse me. We, um, I commandeered a C-130 from the French uh, that was on the on the ramp, and they took us back to King Fod. And then the next day, we started deploying uh, our guys back to the states. There was one other follow-on mission that's of note. Um, there was uh, the biggest loss of uh, of um, of the war for the Air Force anyway was uh, we lost an uh, a AC-130 gunship uh, that was shot down while supporting Marines and um, it was shot down in January. They finally found where that aircraft had crash landed and it was just off the coast of Kuwait in the water. And um, after they found it, we actually sent our uh, team up there from the back then we would call the 1723rd Combat Control Squadron but we sent uh, a team up there and they helped uh, recover the remains of the air crew uh, I was not on that mission I had already returned to the States when that happened and in a way I'm glad I wasn't because one of the guys that was on the crew that was killed uh, Captain Art Galvin was um, an enlisted combat controller and I was the superintendent and his instructor at combat control school, so I don't think that I would have enjoyed recovering his remains. So uh, um, I was glad that I didn't get that mission. <laughs> How many were killed that day? Do you know? How many were on that plane? Uh, let's see. I think there were, hmm, I think 14, 14 or 16 crew members, yeah. Spirit 03 was the call sign of the aircraft. Um it's either 14 or 16 for some reason. I can't remember which number is correct. And they were from Herbert. So, uh, you know, it was quite a quite a loss here at the base uh, where I was working. Wow. So in 1989, uh, we got alerted that uh, the president had called for American forces to go into Panama Noriega, who was a dictator and uh, better known, I guess, as a drug lord. So the mission that uh, Special Tactics had at the time was to uh, seize two airfields 
uh, Trujillo to Cumin, the main airport by Panama City, and then another airfield down at a uh, place on the coast called um, Rio Hato. And initially, Rio Hato wasn't uh, one of the uh, hit places, but prior to the mission, there was some uh, defense force, the Rangers, the Panamanian Ranger force down there had come to Noriega's uh, defense uh, when some things were happening in his country. So they decided that they needed to block that force when coming up there to uh, Panama City. Um, so that mission was laid on, and the this, this 1723rd Combat Control Squadron was given that mission and uh, I was the chief at the 1723rd at the time. So um, we we sent a team in there, and then the rest of the, uh, or the, the 1724th Combat Control Squadron, they went into uh, the main airport. There was also some other combat controllers stationed at Panama at the time, and they had some other non, uh, you know, airborne uh, parachute insertions, but some other... Uh, Taskings, and then we had some other classified taskings where guys were going in uh, prior to the airdrops and so on. Uh, but my mission with our, my squadron was to go into three or to uh, sorry was to go into Rio Hato, and we did that. Uh, it was a 15 ship uh, C-130 formation. We flew out of uh, Fort Benning, Georgia, with the second and third of the 75th Rangers, and. Uh, I forget how many exactly uh, we had for combat controllers and pararescue men on those aircraft, but it was probably about uh, a dozen to 16, something like that. Uh, I was uh, attached to the commander of the 3rd of the 75th uh, Ranger uh, Battalion, a colonel named Colonel Hunt, and I was his combat control or special tactics uh, liaison, if you will. Um I was on the second aircraft to fly over the the uh, airfield, and um, it was funny because uh, I'm trying to trying to figure out as we're going in. Let's see, <laughs> will they shoot down the first aircraft, and the rest of us will turn around and go home, or will they, uh, you know? permit us to get in the air and let about eight or ten drop and then they'll start shooting paratroopers out of the air or what you know it was it was probably one of the hairiest or the hairiest mission that i went on we're jumping uh, at night with heavy equipment on our you know on our bodies uh, weapon and ammo and rucksack with all of our radios and food and water and etc so anyway 500 foot night combat jump and they're shooting at you so so that was pretty, uh, pretty risky. And uh, anyway, we landed. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I broke my radio, and I really wasn't much use to the team for a while. Uh, my schoolmate, uh, Chief Master Sergeant Mike Lampy, who also jumped in, and he was in the 1724th, and we had, I think, four of their guys uh, that joined us. And Mike was able to give my guys the clearance to go ahead and start landing aircraft after 30 minutes to uh, bring in jeeps, uh, gun jeeps, and follow-on forces. So, did you break your radio uh, anyway, when you landed after you jumped? I, I did. I broke my radio when I landed, and unfortunately, I didn't know it until years later. I actually cracked uh, my back, and uh, <laughs> I actually have some problems uh, walking these days with a uh, not a completely dropped foot, but um, I get signals that uh, go into my right leg and foot that don't all work so uh, one of the uh, you know one of the things that you kind of live with if you're a paratrooper or a combat controller you sometimes get hurt and on that <laughs> jump I I did but I didn't know it at the time that the adrenaline was uh, you know sure was flowing and um, the rest of the mission I did my job but I was kind of useless there for about 30 45 minutes and uh until I linked up with everybody, and uh, and things went fine for me after that. But I was a little uh, uh, well. Actually, I did do one thing that was. This is really kind of uh, uh, the opposite of how things are supposed to happen. So here I am, a uh, Chief Master Sergeant E9, and uh, I link up with these Army Ranger privates 
who are lost and can't find where these heavy equipment loads with their Jeeps and everything had landed. So I had night vision goggles, and those Army guys didn't, the Rangers didn't. So I also had a map. I knew where I was at, and I was pretty good in map and compass. I taught that during combat control school. So um, I said, follow me. So here's an E-9 chief. It was the point man leading the Rangers to their <laughs> to their loads uh, where they were supposed to have been dropped. And uh, normally the team leader is in the middle of the formation and some young privates out there <laughs> leading the way. But in this case, it was me. <laughs> but we got them over there and I helped them out. And uh, then I made it back to the airfield and joined my team and, uh, and the Ranger um, Tactical uh, Operations Center and, and took over uh, my job uh, with Colonel Hunt there. Was there a feeling when you were uh, deploying in those days that was there a, like a big sense of confidence that you had in just the U.S. forces altogether and in you know your your equipment and abilities to to really to to take care of any conflict or war in the world? I would say there was. Um, however, at the same time. Um, you know, we we didn't we didn't do too well in Vietnam. We lost a few battles over there, so it was always the unknown of what they actually had for forces and how good they were, how well trained they were. Um, especially like in Desert Storm, because we were told they had you know all kinds of uh, uh, biological uh, you know chemical weapons and uh, and all this, and so we didn't know if they would start firing those at us and you know put germs throughout the air and those kind of things we didn't know if they had a nuclear capability either we didn't think they did but we knew they had chemical capability so that was pretty scary and you don't know how that will come out because we really haven't been in a situation where we've had to deal with you know going to war in chemical suits and fighting in, in chemical suits. Mm -hmm. And if you can imagine being in Vietnam or uh, Panama or even Desert Storm or maybe especially Desert Storm with the heat and everything, those would have been difficult situations if we had to get, you know, chem gear up and try to fight the, fight the war. Well, but, but really, we were, we were confident that we could defeat those forces. Uh, but it was still, you know, in your back of your mind you know how many casualties are we going to take am i going to lose any of my friends am i going to get killed am i going to leave my family behind without you know their dad or their their husband and so on yeah how, how long were your deployments typically uh they actually were not all that long now i before i became a combat controller i was um i was in thailand for a 12-month tour so I was gone from my family after we had our first child. Um, I was gone for the 11 of months of my child's birth, so she was almost a year old when I got back to the States. Um, deployments, I really didn't have a lot of deployments. I had a lot of what we call TDY, temporary duty, for training and for schools, like all those survival schools I went to and free fall school and dive school. Those were all you know, away from home, away from the family. Um, now, I did deploy um, down to Panama, um, and even before that, when I was stationed in the Philippines, we did missions in Cambodia. The war supposedly was already over. We had a classified mission where we go into Phnom Penh, Cambodia. Uh, we weren't allowed to take weapons in. We were in civilian clothes, so that was a pretty scary situation, too, because the enemy was pretty close to taking down the whole country, the people that we were supporting, and we didn't even have a way to defend ourselves as far as having weapons. Um, so I was deployed over there uh, parts of January, February, March, and April of uh, 1975. Uh, I was deployed in Panama for only uh, jumped in, and then I came back uh, not too long after Christmas. So I was only there a couple of weeks. Uh, in Desert Shield, I went over with the advance party. I was the first combat controller to uh, fly over with the 1st Special Operations Wing uh, advance party. And I was only there about a month. And uh, 
our, our director of operations and a bunch of other officers and senior NCOs, non-commissioned officers came over there, and we had lost our commander uh, who had gone to another assignment, and we hadn't got his replacement yet. So there's no, no leadership back at home station to run the squadron. So after we got things rolling over there and uh, uh, we did the uh, King Fahd International Airport air traffic control mission, um, well, they were still doing it when I left, but I came back uh, to lead the squadron, and I also was asked to go down to uh, McDill Air Force Base to interview for the senior enlisted advisor uh, leadership position for the commander of United States Special Operations Command. So... Um, um, I came home early, if you will, and the other guys stayed. I deployed back right after New Year's, and then I was there January, February, and come back the first part of March. Yeah, so you've, uh, I knew you had a lot of interesting, you know, deployments and missions and, and, and stories, and, and I know there's not enough time to even, to even probably brush the surface, but, uh, this has been very good. I, I've enjoyed, hearing just a little bit what you've shared with us uh maybe we'll just make this um make this a part one and we'll do another a part two another time wayne because it's we've actually got okay. a little bit of time in here but it's i mean it, i've really enjoyed it and appreciate you sharing what you've done and in, in these different wars and conflicts and and how you've been kind of a um you led the way in in several instances and i mean how different sure. would you say the the combat control field is today than it was when you were in um, I would say, for one thing, to be to be perfectly honest with anybody, when I first joined Combat Control, I thought it was a lot a lot more than what it really was, and I was a little bit disappointed. Uh, we didn't have a fitness program in a lot of the units. Uh, we weren't uh, doing field tactics very often. We were basically a uh, a training aid or a safety measure to be out on the drop zones and landing zones for military LF command aircraft, uh, providing them with uh, the winds and and uh, making sure the drop zones were clear of uh, you know vehicles and people and so on. So it wasn't uh, my first three years, especially uh, working there at Pope. It was pretty much every day getting in a jeep and going out to the drop zone and throwing smoke grenades to identify the point of impact, saying uh, the words to bring the aircraft in, the control instructions, and throwing a, a can of smoke by our letter identifier panel and uh, watch everybody jump in, the 82nd or whoever, and then uh, equipment loads, and then they had these tactical training bundles, and that's pretty much what I did for like two and a half, three years. We, the only time we got to train was they would give us two weeks every six months to uh, go someplace and someone would take our uh, sp take our um, spot on the drop zones and landing zones so that we could go someplace to train. So I'm talking, you know, four weeks out of the entire year we actually got to do any meaningful tactical training, weapons qualifications and things of that nature. So... Uh, um, that was, um, you know, that was early on and it got better. But uh, one of my goals in life was to make our forces, as well as, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to take credit for this. I'll give Coach Carney, John Carney, and Mike Lampy, and Chief Corelli, and Craig Brochi, and Jeff Buckmelter, officers, and some other people credit for bringing everybody along. But uh, uh, in the beginning, um, we 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 weren't really qualified to go on a tactical special ops mission. I didn't feel. And nowadays, the guys are so well trained, um, and they're in the fight. They deserve to be in the fight. They're as fit as any other force. Uh, they have all the qualifications. They're the best joint terminal attack controllers that the military has to offer, and best uh, you know, if you will, remote air traffic controllers. Uh, great jumpers, uh, you know, combat divers. They can go in by any means to do their job. And uh, and if you look at the amount of uh, uh, awards that these uh, controllers and our now pararescue uh, brothers and tactical air control party guys that are in special tactics and our special ops weather guys, I mean, we're a, or they are a uh, 
a premier elite fighting force and i am so proud of those guys that uh um that's one of the reasons why i i have i stood around or stayed around in the business for so long you know when i retired from my job as a civil service person uh it was on the 50th anniversary of the day i joined the air force and uh you know, many, many of those years it was with the special tactics guys, the combat controllers, and that's because I loved how they did their job, how what they became, and I was just so proud to be be called a brother by any of those guys, and I'm just, you know, um, immensely proud of who they are and what they do, and uh, I think, Thad, for one thing, that's one of the reasons why I am friends with you and your family and a lot of the other guys that we've lost is because I felt it was my duty as kind of being an older guy that, uh, if you will, was one of the plank holders that started us, I thought, in the right um, in the right lane to become a fierce fighting force. Um, then it's my obligation that when we have somebody severely wounded or we lose somebody in combat, that uh, make sure that their families are are well taken care of and that they become part of the combat control or special tactics family because you lost and they lost, um, you know, a family member that we certainly can't replace, but you know that you have a lot of people that are uh, behind you, suffer the loss with you, and are there to help out your family in any way that we can so i'm proud to be a part of that i'm proud to have been on the special ops warrior foundation where we send the kids to college uh, for those that are lost and uh, those that are severely wounded we give them uh, some uh, some money and uh, to help bring family bedside uh, when they arrive in the states and so on so anyway uh, i'm kind of rambling on but uh, i'm i'm Really, really proud of the guys that uh, are serving today, and uh, they went through a much harder pipeline. They're involved in combat so much more than I was that I couldn't hold a, a candle to these folks, but I'm glad that they still call me brother. In fact, a lot of them call me their grandfather. <laughs> <laughs> they, they Actually, they, they uh, kind of... I got the uh, nickname because of being around so long is they kind of nicknamed me the, the godfather of uh, combat control or special <laughs> tactics. <laughs> but occasionally somebody will mess up and say the, God, the, the grandfather instead of the godfather. So I live with both, both names. <laughs> well, you definitely are a pioneer. I mean, you, you really did a lot and have done a lot for the, the community and for the, for the field and, and from someone on the on the side that I'm on, I mean, you, yeah, the, you've done a fantastic job of taking care of the families, and we we've received so much support, and that you know I never ever could have imagined that. I think I don't think there's any way that people in maybe other branches, or maybe just in the big Air Force, you know, outside of special tactics, could feel the way that we feel. Probably, I, I don't know, but it's it definitely is a closeness within the uh, combat control or the, the combat controllers or the special tactics community that that's it's got to be like no other i think so appreciate I, that yeah yeah i think you're right unfortunately the rest of the service uh, probably doesn't have uh, uh that kind of uh organization and and team that we have so yeah i think you're right we we definitely try to uh take care of the families i think we do a pretty good job